Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Frank Sesno. I'm the director of the School of Media and Public Affairs at the George Washington University. I am, uh, unlike Chuck Todd, a recovering journalist, although I'm not sure you can ever fully recover uh, for many years at, uh, at, at CNN, uh, where I had the great pleasure to travel the world and cover historic figures like this gentleman here and uh, previous administrations and lives and see some of the work you got uh, to do up close. And I will moderate the conversation here this afternoon. Um, what we really want to do uh, uh, after welcoming our panelists is uh, take a look at uh, this intersection of development, diplomacy, and the economic impact that it can and does have on this country. Because as Chuck pointed out just a moment ago, a few moments ago, there is quite a, an explanation job, a sales job. And maybe we need those kids <laughs> sitting up here because they were pretty good. And I know that I listen to my kids, so <laughs> maybe other people will as well. Last year, I had the honor to moderate uh, with the USGLC a discussion on uh, President Obama's new uh, global development policy. Uh, Secretaries Clinton, Gates, and Geithner were there, Administrator Shaw, and the CEO of the Millennial uh, Challenge Corporation, Johannes, as well. And much of that conversation that we had at the time uh, focused on the role of development in terms of our national security. And I remember still the words of Secretary Gates, uh, who said development is much cheaper than war. And it surely is in every way. Uh, but today we want to expand on that conversation. We want to bring this economic component, the jobs component in. As we know from the numbers and the statistics and the stories, the real life stories in this country and the political impasse, we need to make this connection if we're going to make the sale and if we're going to have a persuasive uh, and in, an informed uh, conversation. Um, since 9-11, surely Americans understand that national security is tied up with these issues. Uh, but today we increasingly come to understand, and having just come back from China and points in Asia, uh, it's ever more graphic that our economic prosperity is tied in with these issues. So let us get started. And um, Mr. Zellick, perhaps we could start with you. And thank you very much for being here. Glad to be here. Taking out a few minutes <laughs> from uh, World Bank business. Um, I wonder if you could explain a little bit. You have a term you use called, uh, that, you, that you describe when you talk about your mission, modernizing multilateralism. Um, and rather than simply giving assistance uh, to help build capacity and other things in, in local governments, you want to build that capacity so they can promote their own economic growth. How do you view those investments in infrastructure and rule of law and all those other things as promoting economic growth and tying into economic growth um, in this country? Well, first, if you permit me, I, I just want to thank all of you for taking part in this. Uh, this is a great group. Um, it's coincidental uh, because of the years I work with the Congress um, when I've had a chance to go up with some of the appropriators and talk to them about building coalitions. You know, some of them come a little bit from an economic background or security background. And I emphasize that the critical need is the, the business community, the economics, the security, but also many of the church groups. Um, if you we had some pretty important events in southern Sudan uh, just over the weekend with the independents. And one of the things that's really transformed the international politics is the support of these groups. So I think bringing these together and kind of seeing their interconnections uh, is particularly important. And I, I apologize, but I just have to thank uh, uh, Bill Lane and Julia because when I was trade representative, Caterpillar and Boeing were really absolute stalwarts. And for Bill, I don't know where you are, but I can just assure you I'm going up to see Rob Portman later today. I'll relay your message. Um, <laughs> but find out what's going on the budget side. Um, he was saying very good things about you. <laughs> uh, modernizing multilateralism. Um, let me real briefly give you the context of this, because it, it really fits what this group's about. Um, the perspective that I bring to this actually goes back to the one that you know, some of us learned in school, which was the whole creation of the multilateral system for trade and development and finance you know, started in Bretton Woods in 1944 by some far-sighted people that said the 1930s were the, the economic collapse that partly led to the crisis in, in World War II. So they tried to create a system to try to avoid some of those problems. Well, if you think about the huge changes between the world of 1944 and 1950 today, Bill really started to encapsulate some of them. And they really, uh, I've seen them in my own sort of recent career over the past 10 years when I started with USTR, whether it be in trade, whether it be in development, climate change, monetary and financial affairs. 
and it's, it's the rise of emerging markets. And this has happened, well, people look at the numbers in general. I don't think it's begun to filter through the policy and politics. And just to give you one sense, about half of global growth today comes from developing countries. In the 90s, it was just in the 20%. I mean, it's that big, okay? About 47% of the oil is now going to developing countries. China alone takes about uh, a quarter of the soybeans and about a third of the eggs uh, from the agriculture area. And if you get up to some of the minerals, the zinc and the iron, it's like 40%, 45, 50%. So you, you used in the video the kind of the reference about 95% of the public. When we used to use that 10 years ago, people would say, yeah, but they don't necessarily buy that much, they're poor. You're growing at 8 or 10 percent, and it changes the world pretty quickly, and China's been growing about 10 percent for 30 years. But let's also even take this to Sub-Saharan Africa. A lot of people don't realize that Sub-Saharan Africa was growing at about 5 percent a year for a decade before the crisis. And those, those are countries, some of which were struggling with war and kind of sinking, and some that were going up. So there's been this huge transformation that hasn't yet been reflected in the multilateral system. And so when I talk about modernizing multilateralism, it's everything from changing the World Bank so we're faster, more flexible, and, and kind of adjust to some of the changing needs in infrastructure or safety nets or global food security. But it's also some of the aspects of the system beyond us, um, and whether it be trading regime or climate change or, or other aspects. So one of the parts that I really appreciate all of you getting engaged in this you know, all of you are, have familiarity with Washington. You understand the preoccupation is often, you know, what's going on in Washington or what's going on in the home district. And I'll tell you, I really get concerned about the fact that the United States is not keeping up with the pace of changes. And, uh, it, you know, it's partly on the trade side. You know, you talk about development assistance, which, of course, is everybody's favorite item to whack. Um, I'll just point out, you know, that Britain, which is having a very, very tough budget effort, is actually increasing their development assistance. Australia is doing the same. These numbers, as, as the report showed, are not big, but I'll tell you, they're a huge investment for what you get. So whether it's the case of, you know, if you think about um, infrastructure development now, about a third to 50 percent of what, pe what developing countries buy for infrastructure comes from developed countries. So the types of machinery that, uh, that CAT sells. Uh, or some of the other products of the design. And one of the areas that, you know, as you look at the U.S. economy, you see it's increasingly a service economy. But if you think about trade these days, it's no longer the traditional barriers. It's often the behind the border barriers. So it's logistic systems, it's custom systems, information systems, it's how to make the ports well. And again, a lot of U.S. firms can be very, very competitive and are competitive in that market. So to me, the challenge that I'm trying to do at the bank is make this sort of grand old institution created 60 or 70 years ago to be able to keep up with affairs in terms of the agenda we set. But frankly, the bigger challenge is, is the United States going to play a role in modernizing this system? And frankly, I have to tell you, that's a question mark. It's a question mark. Now, when you sit down with a dubious congressional member, do you say, look, this is a dollar for dollar investment? How do you make, how do you take that and make the sale? Well, I'm an old trade representative, so I learned to do this a little retail. So the main thing is I try to find out what their interests are. It depends what, what state they are. If they're in agriculture. But they're local businesses. It, well, in agriculture. I was just in Kansas City on Friday uh, talking to the Kansas City Fed and the Kansas City Economic Club. Uh, and obviously, if you're in the farm economy, you darn well know the importance of international markets because if you're looking at soybean prices, corn prices, wheat prices, cotton prices, you know, much of that is driven by the international environment. Um, so some of that, if, if you're in the certain manufacturing sectors, you can make part of the case. But for some congressmen, as I mentioned, it, it may be an interest in um, Liberia, which church groups have an interest in. It may be an interest in southern Sudan. Uh, it, we're one of the biggest and most effective players in Afghanistan. So if you're concerned about the economics of security in Afghanistan or Pakistan, we're working right now on, you hear about the security strategy for sort of withdrawal or, or sort of coming out over time, there's an economic component to that. There'll be a negative economic multiplier effect of that that people really haven't focused on. So the main point is to recognize what 
people used to think of development as sort of charity or do good or in the European term solidarity. It's now self-interest. And the question is, what's the degree of self-interest? Is it trade? Is it investment? Is it sort of our concern about disease over the world? Is it our concern about kind of some of the values aspects? But it, it, it's ultimately making the political sale on the self-interest of America. Chris, let's talk about self-interest yeah. in a business context, because you're, you're a businessman. We were talking backstage about this, this great mark that's been around for that's right. 100 years. That's right, 100, about, about 100. I was a little kid with this stuff on the <laughs> toast. You know, If you're good, you got Land of Lakes butter. Um, how many countries are you in? Uh, we operate in about 70 countries. Uh, a lot of that is development driven, but uh, we're, we're global. You signed this letter that uh, talked about the key to American jobs is smart, smart Right. power foreign policy, um, one that, and I'm quoting from it now, elevates and strengthens our development and diplomacy programs funded by the international affairs budget. As a CEO, why, why does a CEO sign a letter like that? Why are business leaders caring about global development? Well, um, there's a couple reasons. One I'll, I'll mention, um, and it's worth mentioning, there's a, a humanitarian motivation uh, that's out there, and I think uh, businesses maybe looking at the long, long haul uh, have seen that for a while. I know that's true in our company. But um, when you get right down to the short-term motivation, you heard it from Bob, you heard it from the kids, it's about growth. Uh, our economic growth is linked to global growth, and it's not just the fact that 95% of the world lives outside of this country. It's the fact that their growth rates are far superior to the developed world. So you've got 8 to 10 percent growth uh, in the near term in the BRIC countries, uh, uh, a fraction of that in the developed uh, countries too, 4 percent. So it really is, is about growth. And, and it's not an academic discussion. Uh, 12 percent or so of our GDP is already uh, associated with uh, global exports. Um, you know, one in five or one in seven uh, jobs can be linked back to global trade or, or global exports. And, you know, getting right back to Land O'Lakes, you might say, what about this company that's been around 100 years and, and is known for its butter? Uh, that's a big part of who we are, uh, but we also have animal feed and crop inputs. And our best future growth prospects as a farmer-owned company located in the Midwest of the United States, we've achieved a level of scale here, our best growth prospects are overseas. Can you connect some of your efforts in terms of global development with business breakthroughs or progress? Yes, and, and I think we can do a better job as a company, and frankly, I think all of us can do a better job making that, that linkage. Uh, let me give you an example. We have for years, uh, in our development funds, uh, we've accessed, uh, we started our development group about 35 years ago. Uh, some smart folks said, uh, you know, we know a lot about getting food from farm to market. Seems like that skill would be useful in parts of the world where they have trouble with that. So you went over as a, as a company? As a company, and we ran that at break even, uh, accessing USAID or USDA funds in development projects. And you turn the clock forward until this era, and we've got a, pro a, a program in Malawi where we, uh, we give cows to individual Malawi producers, and their lives are changed. And we've historically talked about that entirely in humanitarian terms. We've said, look at what this does to a family in Malawi. We give uh, some cows to a, a woman, a head of household, and her life changes. She can afford health care uh, for her children. She can afford education for her children. She can buy fertilizer for her crops. They go from poverty to, to a level of wealth. And that's all accurate. But you know what? I think we need to pivot just a little bit and say, what we've also done is create a safe, reliable, high-quality supply of milk because what we've done is get cows to produce milk, to go to a collection station, to link to a market, and that's part of the project we ran. But as we describe this more in commercial terms and make that linkage between development and the commercial side of the equation, um, I think a lot of good things happen. Um, you know, we're providing a safe raw material, high quality raw material to what? To the beverage market. And Africa, as Bob says, is a growth market. Uh, and if you're at one of the great beverage companies uh, here in the country, uh, this country, don't you think that that's one of the markets you want to focus right. on? Absolutely. What's one of your barriers? Access to raw material. So I think your question, Frank, is a really good one, and it's the linkage of the development side of our, of our work with the commercial side of our work, and I think there's a big opportunity because then we can scale things more aggressively. John, I want to come to you in just a minute and talk about uh, support for, for, for businesses, but before I do, Chris, I'm, I'm interested in something. And that is, you know, Americans are skeptical today. 
and, and, and they're scared. Mm. And we see that in the political rhetoric all the time. We hear it. But when you go around and you talk to farmers and you talk to others and you talk, do they get it? I mean, they know that a lot of their business is coming through exports. Do they connect? Is this an easy sale to connect development and diplomacy to actual business? Well, it's not an easy sale, um, but it's a sale that can be made if you really step back and slow down. And, and the debate with our owners about spending time uh, overseas with markets isn't all that different than the debate we see in society right now about the development budget. But you know, it's uh, a little bit of effort, a little bit of the spending, the 1% that goes into uh, our, our foreign assistance budget uh, has a huge payoff. So it is, a, it is important to recognize that you have to explain the rationale to this. Uh, but once you do, uh, the facts are so friendly. 95% of the world, the kids had it right. 95% of the populations outside of this country, their growth rates are superior to ours. What, uh, when we ship to those markets, we create jobs here at home. Uh, and that story, it's pretty simple, carries the day with our owners, and I think it's one that we need to tell better in society. John, let's talk about competitiveness for, for just a second and open this up. And by the way, we're going to take your questions here, do it a little bit differently. You'll see cards on your tables, so fill those out. They'll be brought up here. We've got the first one. Oh, we're going to do audience mic and questions on cards. Okay, so if you're not bashful, there's a microphone for you. But if you want to be literate and precise with the written word, put it on a card and send it up, and we'll incorporate that in. John, uh, competitiveness. competitiveness. Um, you know, a lot of countries, uh, China among them, but also our allies, uh, provide a great deal and, and, and more, a higher percentage of their overall budget to international economic uh, programs that provide export assistance. How should the United States be doing it? How should we ensure that our companies and our corporations are as competitive in this incredible global marketplace? Well, I, I do think that in the business community there's a very strong conviction that the international affairs budget is an important part of how we're going to be able to tap those growing markets. You know, it's 95% of humanity, 95% of the people we want to sell something to live outside the United States. Um, the investment that we make in the international affairs budget is really the, the diplomacy and the development that's the front line of America's ability to get out there and, and make those sales. Let me give a couple of examples. Uh, you know, when President Obama la late last year went to India, he was able to announce $15 billion worth of sales by American companies. Now, American diplomats played a critical role in helping a number of those deals to go forward. You know, some of them would have happened anyway. But if we're not making the investment in, in the safety and security and the training of American diplomats, uh, you had better believe that President Sarkozy is going to be out there and French diplomats are going to be making the case. Um, another example I would mention is the U.S. Export-Import Bank, which is also funded out of the international affairs budget. It's been around for 70 years. It's uh, underwritten trade finance for uh, more than $400 billion worth of American exports in that time. Um, it's, it's doing a great job, and it plays a critical role for American companies being able, being able to finance competitively their sales overseas. But last year, um, Canada, uh, which is a country that has an economy about a tenth the size of the United States, their export credit agency was able to underwrite three times as much the export finance as our Export-Import Bank. And Chinese export credit agencies were able to underwrite 17 times as much uh, trade finance for Chinese exports. Um, the point is that if we don't make this investment in the international affairs budget, uh, well, it's a competitive world, and uh, that would be tantamount to uh, unilateral economic uh, disarmament as we go into competition. When you're talking for about markets. numbers of that size and scale, 17 times, mm -hmm. China growing 10% for 30 years running. I read someplace a few years ago that if the United States has grown, had grown as fast as China over a 20 year period, we would have been where we were, plus we would have created a Japan. But how do, so what is required? You say, you know, it's not just a question of not cutting what's there, and that's going to be hard enough. How much growth is required? Well, what we're talking about today in this difficult fiscal environment is at the least being able to have a robust international affairs budget that allows our diplomats to do their work, that allows agency like XM, like the U.S. Trade and Development Agency, 
to go out there and make the case for uh, American business to be able to make those sales. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a formula that's working today. You know, already American exports support one in three factory jobs. Um, it's one in three acres on American uh, farms that are planted for export. Um, we have the, the ingredients for success in competing in this global economy, um, but we, know, we can't afford to be going out and eating the seed corn that helps that to happen. Let me ask all of you, sort of throw this out as a jump ball. If we think about the growth in developing countries and, and just what success stories and how fast this has all happened, you know, look at uh, Brazil and South Africa and, and certainly China and Indonesia and Korea and on and on it goes, how has economic growth in these countries, this very rapid growth, created opportunities, new opportunities, and why don't you start us off, uh, Bob, uh, for American companies? Well, there's a couple things that uh, I, I just draw in on this. You know, we, we talk about money, but there's a lot of things the U.S. government could do without money. Uh, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, and you've got people here in the audience who worked on it, the United States has been dead on the water in trade agreements for five years. Okay, so you're, you're now having a debate on the Hill about Colombia, which I almost finished, and I left in January 2005. So you got Panama, which again was one we started. South Korea, and here's the interesting question, I spend time on the Hill, ask people what's next. What's, well, what are they thinking about? And what are they, you know, what, are you want to try to do something with, well, they don't think about it because <laughs> frankly, people need to be looking over the hill to decide, do you want sectoral agreements? Do you want a free trade agreement with Japan? you want something with European Union? If you don't have a vision, you're not going anywhere. Okay, now right now it's all hung up with trade adjustment assistance. But here's, there's some very interesting work done by a guy named Matt Slaughter up at Tuck School. It's all tied up with TAA. Okay, well, there's a, there's a trade adjustment assistance, there's a Workforce Investment Act, there's an unemployment insurance system that's about 90 years old. These involve billions and billions of dollars. Why doesn't somebody take those and say, well, how do we actually restructure to get people back into jobs in an effective way and overhaul systems that are 70 and 80 years old? I'm trying to modernize multilateralism, which is 50 or 60 years old. You've got some programs out there that some people can push. So part of it is, let's get a trade agenda going forward with, a, with an effective support for, for workers. I mean, you've got some representatives of political candidates here. Jobs would probably be a pretty good selling point. You can connect this to jobs. A second point uh, is that we talk about this still a little bit as kind of a one-way street, you know, with the developing world and sort of exports. I'll tell you what we're also missing. There's a lot of ideas out there in the developing world, and people in the United States, if they're not open to them, things are going to move past them. We've talked about debt in the world, okay, and we know all the states are in difficult financial situations. I can't go to a developing country without people talking about how to get private capital into infrastructure. Every one of them is trying to design models, and I'm set actually setting up an infrastructure, uh, infrastructure center of excellence in Singapore to kind of come up with the right investment packages. What about toll roads in America? Mitch Daniels privatized his toll road, made a big, you know, it was a big political issue. He made about four billion dollars on it, and has a much better running toll road. So we look about liabilities. What about assets? Now I'm telling you, if you don't look at the rest of the world, you're going to miss what's going on out there. So the and you talked about investment. Um, we created, I have a private sector arm called IFC, we, we created an asset management corporation because we did what Willie Sutton did, we went where the money was. We went, <laughs> we went to sovereign wealth funds and we said, okay, how do we get you to invest in the developing world? And we've had about a 20% rate of return over 20 years with IFC. So we took pension funds, sovereign funds, and we created a billion dollar investment fund basically for sub-Saharan Africa. And I, when I went to the pension, one of the pension funds and said, okay, now why are you interested in this? They say, well, we now know developed markets are risky too. And developing markets are where a lot of the growth is, but we kind of don't know where you know, the, the transactions information costs. So we're gonna change that over the course of five or 10 or 15 years. And there's gonna be a lot of capital and there's gonna be a lot of investment opportunities. And some of those are going not just into traditional manufacturing, but they're going into healthcare systems, they're going into the logistics systems, uh, they're going into a series of education for training service systems. Things where America as a knowledge economy should be able to compete pretty well. But I'll tell you, if you go up to the Congress you go and ask people, what are you thinking about to make America more competitive? They don't look beyond the border. And, and I'm telling you, from my nature of my work, first in trade, but now particularly work with 187 countries, 
The United States has had an advantage position over the world, but it's not God's gift. They're not looking beyond the border. How are you going to get them to look beyond the border? These so people. That you've got a border to look beyond. You, you know, Frank, I think part of that answer is we need to tell our stories and we need to make them very tangible. And, and I can tell you one for our company, a company 100 years old, formed by dairy farmers and, and uh, local cooperatives in rural America. Uh, when I said our best growth prospects are, are global, uh, you know, one example would be uh, to serve this uh, exploding population in Asia, uh, where you have not just population growth, but the emergence of a, of a middle income, and, and what do they do? They improve their diets. So right now, out of domestic facilities, we are shipping as much as we can make uh, dairy proteins overseas. And you might say that's pretty interesting, and it does create jobs. But you know what? It leads to future growth, because as we go over into Asia, uh, we're working with who? Big transnational companies who value quality. Uh, our prices are a little higher than uh, other alternatives they might have, but our quality is, is uh, I believe, pretty darn good. Uh, but they say, boy, you've got an animal feed division, and, and you know we're over here in China, and we're interested, and we need a locally sourced uh, supply of milk. And uh, can you help our local producers with better animal feed? You betcha we can. Uh, we can send you a value-added feed product uh, or ingredients to China to supplement the locally produced. So what impact has this had on the jobs that you provide? People? Well, it's uh, on one hand, it's transformational in terms of our uh, horizon, uh, our vision of, of what we can be over the, next, uh, over the next 100 years, over the next 5, 10, uh, 15 years. We see our, play, our, our role as a much more uh, growth-oriented company than a company that serves uh, this domestic market. So it's, it's really transformed the way we think about our business. And uh, you know we are gearing up for that kind of growth. Uh, but it, it does, uh, I think we have to tell our stories better, Frank, to, to really get folks to realize that it's, there's a real practical element of this. It, you know, I can point to jobs in, in a plant in Tulare, California that otherwise wouldn't be there without this global growth opportunity. I can point to jobs in St. Louis, Missouri at our feed facility or a feed research facility that otherwise wouldn't be there. And the more we tell those stories, I think it's the easier it is for us to talk about that 1% in a real practical way. John, I know that Walmart and USAID recently announced a partnership uh, to work with rural farmers in Central America to build capacity and get food to market. Um, the World Bank works with the private sector uh, around the world, obviously, in, in diverse sectors such as health and climate, uh, climate ad adaptation. Um, I, was at a very interesting conference a couple of weeks ago, U.S. India um, uh, business uh, uh, group, and uh, Fred Smith was there from FedEx. 290,000 employees in over 200 countries, and they are providing some educational and other benefits on the ground with their employees. Um, has the private sector across the board uh, become more involved in promoting healthier, more productive societies? Is the chamber working with them? Is this a concerted? effort, or is this still a very sporadic sort of thing? I, I think that there are a great deal uh, of these, there's so many of these success stories that we're seeing today. And we, we often put them under the name of trade capacity building. And some of it comes from governments, but a great deal of it comes from the private sector. As you mentioned, you know, Walmart helping to train Honduran farmers on how to raise produce at a level that's, that's good enough for them to sell in their, in their supermarkets and help them become part of a modern economy. I think also of Guatemala, where um, uh, after the uh, free trade agreement with Central America came into force, um, companies like FedEx came in and worked with the customs authorities in Guatemala really to reinvent an express delivery clearance system there. So right. the private sector is playing that kind of role. Um, too often we don't tell the story very well, as Chris is pointing out, um, and there's a great deal more that we can do. The World Bank has had a project that they're undertaking right now on, on the Aid for Trade initiative as well, uh, which is bringing together companies and the public sector to try and do that a little better. And you know, it's, it's all part of being able to make the case um, for, for open economies and for the kind of investments we're talking about here. All right, today. let me take a couple of questions here. We have this in and then we've got the microphones as well. The first one is on a card here. The World Bank, that's you, launched a new agriculture fund with, among others, contributions from South Korea. What enabled them to grow from donor recipient to contributor? Well, that's a that's a wonderful story. I mean, if you if you look at uh, South Korea's economy uh, after the Korean War in 1953, it was much worse than Egypt or uh, many of the economies in Sub-Saharan Africa. And fundamentally, uh, 
the most basic part of development has to start with local ownership. And this is the hard lesson, is that outsiders, no matter how well-intentioned, can't do it for people. So you have to have the property rights, the legal system, the right sort of investment climate. Now, as some of you who know about South Korea's development, it wasn't always by any means an open economy. Um, but what it did do was it was open enough in the export market that it learned how to get higher levels of competition, competitiveness, which increased productivity, which increased wages, and now South Korea is actually a very generous uh, contributor to the World Bank. There's a little bit of this actually going on with the middle-income countries too, more than one recognizes. In other words, part of this modernizing multilateralism is sharing the responsibilities in the system. So just to give you a little bit of reference point, we have something called IDA, which is the fund for the 79 poorest countries. And we recycle the funds and we put some of our own income in, but we get contributions every three years. Uh, this year, uh, China was not only a contributor, but actually prepaid some of its funds on the order of billions of dollars, which is a way that we're trying to share the load. So I think going back to your, your other question, Frank, I think for, for members of Congress, if they feel the United States is the only one carrying the load, that makes it a harder sell. And part of the responsibility for institutions like the World Bank is trying to make sure that others, whether the South Koreas or the, some of the other emerging markets also uh, contribute. But what I also hope we can convey is there are a lot of developed countries that are doing a lot more than the United States. And I mentioned Australia, I mentioned Britain, Canada. And so at this critical moment, frankly, why I know there's a lot of budget pressure, but other, a lot of countries are a lot of budget pressure and they're not doing what the United States is, which is almost wiping it out. Better convince people not to, not to eat the seed corn. Let's go to the microphones over here. Thank you. Uh, I'm Bob Castro. I, I had the benefit of working at the State Department while uh, Mr. Zellick was Deputy Secretary and doing Ways and Means trade work how, while how he was do? USTR. Um, <laughs> but it, it struck me for some time, something that Chris said really makes this question open for everyone, um, that while the statistics are generic, the stories are what gets specific. And page eight here of the publication is great because it says one in five jobs uh, in the U.S. is related to trade, but all of the faces are blank. So who knows who that one is? A consumer has a chance to look at the label and the price tag when they buy something. So they know what country it's coming from, they know if they're getting a good price. Have you all done anything in your company or are there any suggestions of how to make sure that that one in five or whatever it is for Land Lakes or other companies know? Or if it's one fifth of their paycheck comes from overseas, does it say that on their pay stub? So my suggestion is that you get it to the specific of people so that folks in this audience can help make that case. And so if, uh, the, my question is, if you have a suggestion or an improvement to my suggestion, what's the best way to get people whose jobs are, are export dependent to know that it's their job? Well, I'll react to it and, and just say I agree. I, I think it goes back to one of the comments I made earlier, actually I made it twice, that I think we can do a better job telling our stories. And you know, if you take that back to your, own, uh, to your own home, it does mean doing exactly what you've said. And I'll add uh, that in today's world of social media, uh, some of your most powerful storytellers are your own employees, uh, the vendors who are dependent upon your your success, which is increasingly dependent upon the global economy. So I think you're right on the button. I think we need to do a better job. But do you, so do you take your farmers on your trips, uh, you know, your members are on trips r r around the country so that their pictures and their stories can come back and they can see where their deals are going and where their products are going? Absolutely. Uh, we're doing both of these things. Uh, uh, annually, I've been taking uh, our board members on overseas trips. Uh, three years ago was... Uh, was China uh, this year through uh, developed Europe uh, and uh, a, a year in the middle, I've skipped a year, was to Brazil. Uh, why? To, to have them see firsthand uh, the stories, uh, the kind of business that we're doing and the potential for future business and how that relates back to their own And get them to interest. tell their stories, get them to be, uh, absolutely. they can tweet. Uh, the second thing is with our own employees. Uh, we are working hard, in fact, uh, we have our, our communications person here today uh, and I hope she's tweeting. Um, but uh, we are trying to engage our employees to do just exactly what you've described. Uh, but that's part of our success. Go ahead, John, very yeah. quickly. If I could just quickly add on, the Chamber actually has a program called Trade Roots where we profile small and medium-sized companies that are already benefiting from exports. So you've got an anecdote about a, a real company that has been able to 
double or triple its jobs from often from two to four or to six um, because of exports and that often stand to benefit from being able to sell more thanks to a trade agreement with you're a country like Colombia. You're just up against a ferocious enemy, which is misunderstanding and fear, because so much of the narrative is that trade costs us jobs. So these are the stories that you have to tell compelling. And I think that's the, uh, the power of the suggestion we heard in this dialogue. I mean, if you think about what I said, I've, in the last three years, taken a large number of uh, dairy farmers and uh, local cooperative owners to China, Brazil, and, and through developed Europe. And once they're there, that fear is gone. They see opportunity, and we have to make it real. That's a good question. Thanks. Good afternoon. Steve Kakoff, founder of the Kakoff Group Language Solutions from Miami. Uh, we've heard today about how the Boeings and Caterpillars of the world are investing in uh, developing markets. But what are some of the opportunities for smaller businesses? Well, I think that for smaller companies, um, you know, the, the things that we've seen that have worked in recent years are, um, it, it may, often we see these companies start getting into exporting by focusing on a, a country such as Canada or Mexico, which are our immediate neighbors. They're less, um, the, the, bur the barriers to getting in there are lower. Um, we've seen that trade agreements, such as the ones that have been negotiated in recent years, are helpful because they take away not just tariffs, but also the non-tariff barriers that can be a really big deal for a small business. You know, a small business, they can't afford to create an affiliate in a foreign country. They can't afford to hire all the lawyers to get around different provisions in law in a foreign country. Um, and it's also useful what we see groups like the Export-Import Bank doing. They have um, a program that's called Global Access which is reaching out all across the country in a road show that the chamber is helping with, and the NAM as well, um, to uh, explain to small and medium-sized enterprises um, how you can get the trade finance you need to be able to tap foreign markets. There's two, two other quick thoughts on this. W one is that, um, you know, if you look at the German economy today, it's been doing quite well. And one of the reasons it's been doing quite well is the Mittelstand. These very small, at sometimes medium-sized businesses that are often engineering-based, but they are heavily export-driven. And it's interesting you mentioned this, because I was, I was actually thinking that one of the things that the Chamber or the others, maybe in the Congress, should actually look at is, why does it work well in Germany and doesn't work here? It's a little bit of an example of what I said. We don't have to invent it all here. There's other places around the world that have made this work, and maybe we can understand a little bit better why their small and medium-sized enterprises are very outward-oriented. But I think there's a second reason that's connected. Look, and this is why it's a big challenge. The United States was a continental-sized economy. Frankly, Germany wasn't. So people kind of got used to this economy. And what the message of all this is, for the next 10 or 15 years, if you're only relying on the US, you're missing a heck of a series of changes. So one other possibility is some of the bigger enterprises. Like what we do abroad is when we do an investment we, to support small enterprises, we have a series of logistics interconnections. We try through IFC, our private sector arm, to help small businesses provide the services. I know that some of the larger enterprises actually had some of their U.S. suppliers and try to, when they went abroad, they actually try to connect some of their operations. But this, this is another set of idea where, I mean, my message is we got to get out of the old framework. It's not going to work at the pace that we need to do. And it's going to be a combination of some of the, the multinational corporations as well as looking what works abroad and maybe we can learn some things from them. Two quick bills because I think the facts are very friendly as it relates to small business being supported. I told you the story about that plant in the Central Valley of California that we have. It, it has a few thousand workers in it. Big plant. But guess what? It employs a lot of local plumbers, electricians, uh, architects, engineers uh, that are benefiting from that global growth. So those small businesses that are located here, in a sense, are, are benefiting from the global economy as well. Beyond that, uh, when, I get, uh, when I think about our development uh, uh, projects, uh, for years, uh, again, we've been involved in global development, accessing US uh, AID funds or USDA funds. Uh, there, there was a project in East Africa to improve animal agriculture. Uh, you know, we didn't do that, but we found somebody who did, and that company now exists, and it's a vibrant company. I think it's uh, Worldwide Sires uh, that, that specifically uh, enjoyed the growth from that uh, that development project. 
So I think the facts are pretty friendly as to small business participation in global growth, not just big business. You say just the facts are one, good. one other point I forgot, because I think you know, we're talking about some of the stuff abroad. We can think about some of the investment in the United States, too. Um, I don't have the precise statistics with me, but I read it recently. It, it wasn't too long ago that about 4% of foreign direct investment came from emerging markets. Last year, it was about 14 or 15%, and it's only going to go up. Now, one of the things the United States has to decide is, are we going to be open to foreign investment? Is it okay when people actually bring jobs to America? Are we going to think this is a big threat? Um, because, you know, right now, foreign investors, not only do they help create jobs, but they bring technology, they bring marketing networks. And these are some of the issues that you got with a protectionist movement that says, oh, no, we can't allow the country X or Y to buy a firm. To me, that's a loss of jobs. You say the facts are friendly, but... Um the facts are sometimes missing, and here's a question from uh, Kyle Hardy uh, from the Truman National uh, Security uh, Project. What kind of return on investment can the U.S. expect from investment in the developing world? Quantify it. I mean, and I, I have to think that that's a question that, that comes up in one form or another a lot. John, how do you answer that? Yeah. You know, I, I think about how... Um, you know, recently the, the chamber put together a coalition letter supporting um, the uh, capital increase for the World Bank and the other multilateral development banks. You know, it's a, it's a staggering record that it has. You know, the, if you look at the developing world over the past 65 years, you've seen infant mortality cut in half, life expectancy increase by 20, 25 years. You know, those are the kinds of real metrics that you see from this investment, which is really a very small one from in terms of the American taxpayer. If you're talking about the economy and jobs, if you're trying well, well, to Well, here's a private sector number, is that IFC, our private sector arm, which makes investments in the developing world and private sector companies, that has had an internal rate of return of a little bit under 20% over 20 years. Not bad. Go ahead. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Teresa Yurimian from the Armenian National Committee of America. Um, to the pleasure of co-president lane um, as a student i've fully read the report already um, but my question both stems from the report and the panel's discussion section 907 of the u.s freedom support act um, provides a massive from the 90s pro provided a massive amount of foreign aid to former soviet um, satellites um, but that also banned any type of aid to azerbaijan um, so Every year, the president, uh, thank you. <laughs> Every year, the president waives this ban under the condition that Azerbaijan does not wage war against Armenia. My question is, um, or my point is, uh, even in the report, it uh, states that um, USTA, US, USTDA uh, gave Azerbaijan a grant of $310,000 for seven Boeing 777 aircrafts. The US government itself in their reports gives Azerbaijan about $200 million a year. Is it tenable for the president to continually waive that ban when the Azeri government is threatening to wage war against Armenia? And according to the report, the jobs that it allowed for Americans in Azerbaijan, the 6,800 jobs that it uh, created in order to create those Boeings, it risks both the... Right, let, let's, let, why don't, I think that's, a, that's an important question, and it gets to the sensitive nature of national interest and, and consistency. You've been in the USTR's office, and I don't know if you had to do with Azerbaijan, but take a shot at that. How does that balance work? How do well, you respond to that? Well, she's actually asking about a UST uh, development TDA, assistance, right. but... Uh, it just so happens I was around when the Freedom Support Act was passed, so I'm probably one of the few people other than the Armenian caucus that knows what Section 907 <laughs> is. But I guess what I'd say is, um, look, Armenia and Azerbaijan, you got a serious foreign policy problem there. I understand all the sensitivities. I certainly understand the strength of the Armenian lobby in Congress. God bless you for it all. I know it's really powerful in California. And what you just have to decide, this is actually a good example, is for every Armenia, I can give you about 10 or 15 other countries that people get very sensitive with, and do you just want to hold up all of American business and exports for that? Obviously, you do. They have to decide whether they want to. Okay. Anybody else on that? If not, we'll come to this side. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Carl Hoffman, Population Services International, and a member of the Board of Directors of USGLC. I also had the privilege, like a <clears throat> previous questioner, of working in Bob Zellick's State Department. Um, 
There are influential voices out there, such as Dambisa Moyo, for example, who argue that aid, particularly in Africa, actually frustrates growth, that it leads to corruption, that it leads to dependency. What are the best arguments against those points of view? Let me take a crack at that. Why don't you take a crack at um, Look, th there's always that risk, you know, and so I think the first part is not to deny that there can't be problems of corruption and, and, uh, and poor governments, but there also are huge success stories. I mean, let's start uh, one that John mentioned. Now, there's a lot of lives uh, that have been saved because of an effort that President Bush started as international with anti-malarial or HIV AIDS. Um, now, do you find problems with these programs? Sure. Um, and do you find problems that, by the way, is there corruption in the United States? You bet. And so part of the challenge will be, how do you try to encourage those within those governments that want to emphasize transparency, want to improve governments, want to fight corruption, and what lessons have we learned? And let me just give you a small example. Literally, right before I came here, I looked at a report that our internal investigatory outfit has come up with dealing with roads because it turns out that roads are particularly susceptible to corruption, frankly, in the United States as well as everywhere around the world. And it's partly because of the nature of cartels and how the contracts work. So our team actually went back and said, well, what lessons can we learn about the bidding process, how you bring in the engineers, what sort of outside independent aspects can you have? So then we can work with countries that want to do the right thing on those aspects. So, uh, you know, I, I think there's this very strong obligation for institutions like the World Bank to make sure that every dollar goes where it's supposed to go because it's stolen from the mouths of poor people. But at the same time, you know, uh, I have to say, you know, Dimbisa is a person who kind of benefited from some of the things that she's attacking. And so while she raises a reasonable point, I have to, I get a little frustrated because I've seen a lot of kids whose lives have been saved because of some of that foreign assistance. and. She makes the case, I guess, that humanitarian support is okay, but I guess the only other aspect that I would emphasize, and this is a point that she stresses as well, the more you can emphasize private sector development, the more you can emphasize, as we have with the doing business report, kind of how you make it easier for the private sector, and the more you add transparency, this is one of the big arguments, I mean, the big issues coming out of the Arab Spring, the more that the, the fighting of corruption is not just a question of auditors, or my internal investigators, but you get the public involved with it. So the best little example I can give you, it's a small one, but it's telling, is that uh, we had a program where it's, for example, gave some supplies to schools, and they took the simple step of putting on the door of the school that there were supposed to be X number of textbooks bought and two teachers that show up. So you get the community involved. They say, well, those textbooks never came, and we only have one teacher, not two. So one of the things that actually there's great potential is how you can use much broader media now, and including this spread of telecommunications revolution all across the world, sub-Saharan Africa, to engage the social network and engage the community to fight corruption. About the only thing I'd add to that, and, and it's a societal problem, and as an organization, as a company that's done a lot of development work in Africa, uh, corruption is a societal problem, and I, I, would, I would offer that a, a well-run development project that emphasizes the rule of law, respect for intellectual property, transparency is part of the solution. Uh, it has to operate in that environment, but it's part of the solution. It's how you move that society forward. With apologies to our remaining questioners, uh, we're nearly out of time. I want to take the last question from a card here uh, that raises a very interesting point. Thinking about development assistance, we're talking about education, health, infrastructure, all these things. And perhaps you could answer this because you're, you know, land of lakes after all. Uh, how do you expand markets while responsibly managing natural resources, thereby creating sustainable impact? Well, I'll talk about it from, from our business, which is agriculture. Uh, you know, by bringing good agricultural business practices and safe, proven technology, we actually get more output in a more sustainable way. Uh, you know, we've forgotten that there's a great productivity story right here in America in a sense that we're exporting as we do this. Uh, we grow six and, a half more, six and a half times more corn than we did uh, not all that long ago on 13% fewer acres. Why? better on-farm management practices, and better technology. And by the way, there's uh, less uh, crop protection product used and more benign crop protection product used. I would argue that that success that we've experienced here 
has a role in sustainable development overseas. You want to have one yeah, word? On I, yeah, just here, real briefly. It, it's, 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 it takes the self-interest issue and kind of bronze it. So for example, there's huge gains to be had in the world with energy efficiency. So there's ways you can save money, use less energy, deal with climate change, and uh, it runs through everything from the technology to the market pricing, to helping financial institutions know how to do energy conservation lending as opposed to asset lending. So it's partly making markets work better. And similar, let's take water, because it is that you know, water is actually an area where the world's gonna be facing a challenge going forward. Most people don't price water. Well, if you don't price it, guess what? A lot of it's gonna get used. So you know, some of this is, is in a sense, and this gives you a little sense of what the World Bank does. A lot of our work is not traditional lending. It's, it's trying to help with the knowledge transfer to build markets and institution and capacity with the recognition that none of this will work unless people want to make the changes themselves. But as a little bit of this growth story is saying, they're moving and they're moving fast. And so the United States better get on the train. All right, so, so before we go, Bill challenged all of you to tweet out the message and get the message out. But in TV, we used to say, well, in the 10 seconds remaining, your prediction, I I'm not doing 10 seconds. You got 140 characters. So if you were tweeting on why it's in our economic interests in this country to raise the poorest billion out of poverty, what would you tweet? Uh, what happens there matters here for jobs, for prosperity, and for our values. Well, a few more than 140, but yeah. pretty good. It's pretty hard to improve on that. We are inextricably linked to global growth. Inextricably. <laughs> That's good. I had to get one big word. <laughs> What would you tweet? Uh, values, security, and jobs. Can't top that. Thanks to all of you very much. Thank you.